So my first few years of schooling were in special ed. I had a learning disability where um, I couldn't get along with my peers very well and I also couldn't retain really much knowledge at all. I was having a struggle with reading, math, most of my subjects. I couldn't understand it. Um, and I got some help. But in my fifth grade special ed class, I had this teacher, and I cannot remember her name, but we had this competition between me and one of my other students, or one of my other peers, where we would have a 30 digit long division problem and we would see who could get it done faster. Um, and it really helped to improve my speed and my capabilities and my self-confidence with math. And that really brought pretty much most of the other subjects into focus and were able to let me be able to understand more and I've always tried to find that teacher and I can never remember the name. I've asked the school and they can't figure it out. Um, but I just always remember her and remember how much she helped me and how much she really took the time to get to know me and that other student um, to be able to teach us and to be able to get us to be able to go on to our own. In fact, because, really because of her, the next year I was able to go into a mainstream class um, where I had my teacher, Mrs. Bohai. We called her room the IHOB because it was Bohai backwards and it stood for the International House of Bohai. She was a very strict teacher but she was an amazing one at the same time. Um, she would really push you to your limits, uh, try to get you to think outside the box. Um, and she always really cared for you. And it was amazing. And during this time was really hard at home. My parents though divorced, were constantly fighting and bickering. But I know that these teachers were always here for me and were trying to help me the best that they can. And they were just so amazing. And I really, really wish I could remember that one teacher's name so I could find her and thank her. When I was in junior high, I started reverting back to my old problems of not being able to understand things as well. Um, and pretty much I struggled most of my seventh grade year. I was a smart student, but I struggled with a lot of things still. Um, I was being bullied at school. Um, I really just had a lot going on in my life. Uh, I started having anger problems. I really was trying hard to really just fit in somewhere. And I, during my eighth grade year, I was in my geography, or er, the geology class and it was my last period and I was talking with the teacher afterwards and started talking and hour later we finally realized what time it was and then I should have been home by now so <laughs> I called my mom and said sorry I was talking with the teacher and she thought I was in trouble it was hilarious but ever since after that, um, he really started to talk to me more. We talked after school quite a bit. He showed me things that the other kids didn't get to see. Um, he taught me more.
he answered all the questions I had, and he was a really good friend. Um, and he was just so cool. He was a geologist by major. Um, he worked in the field for about five years, if I remember correctly, and then he um, decided that he was done doing it in the field, so he became a teacher and decided to teach um, the next generation about it. And he was just so cool because he had the experience under his belt to be able to really get us into this subject um, and be able to help us to understand more. Um, And there was another teacher, Mrs. Halsworth, if I remember correctly, or something like that. She was my um, English literature teacher. And she got me, me, between her and my stepmom, they got me into reading really hard. And I still read a lot. Um... But she was another teacher that was very inspiring to me. She really had a passion for reading. I don't think I've ever seen a time where her teacher desk did not have three or four or possibly even five books on it that she was currently reading or about to read. Um, she was an amazing teacher. Um, when I had struggles with other kids or other teachers, I knew I could turn to her for help, and she would talk me through it, um, and when it came time, she would um, bring the principal if it needed it, one time it did, um, and she always was there for me, and it was awesome to know that those people were here for me. My first year of high school, I was in mainstream, and I moved, the divorce decree changed, and I got switched to live with my dad, and when I moved down there, um, because of certain circumstances and things, I was put in at homeschooling. Um, and I was not doing too well in it. I didn't do my work. I pretty much sat at home playing video games most of the time. But towards the end of my homeschooling time, I think I finally realized that I really do need to get back into trying at least to do my homework as hard as it was to focus um, and it was just such a wonderful experience after I really put my focus into it um, which was very short-lived um, but it was it taught me a lot about myself and my ADHD, how I cannot focus on work unless I have someone there to help me, um, to guide me, and to make sure I stay focused on it. Um, and in fact, just the other day, I found one of my homeschooling books in my closet. That has now been overdue for about four to five years. That'll be interesting to take back to the school and make sure they get it back. Um, so. During my 10th grade year, some things happened. I got into some trouble and I was really having a hard time in my life and 
I got sent down to Cedar City, Utah, and I went to a private school there. Um, for two years, I lived at the school. I received therapy to help me, and I went to school there where I ended up graduating six months early because it was an awesome school. I was almost a year behind in school because of all the Fs I had gotten. And because of how wonderful the school was, they were able to not only catch me up, but also get me ahead to the point where I could graduate. Um, it was very interesting. I had four teachers who each taught two to three, I think one of them even taught four subjects. Um, it was similar to a regular school in the fact that we had eight different classes per day. Uh, well, at least for the first part, then we switched to an A-B schedule. But it really, and then of course I was taking about 10 classes per day because I also had two classes that I would do after um, to help catch me up. It was very hard, not only because of I had to deal with the schoolwork, but I also had to deal with the therapy part of the day. Also being away from my family for two years was really hard. But because of that, I became a different person. I grew up, I became more responsible, and I was able to become my true self. I didn't have to hide it behind my mask of anger or frustration and other things anymore. I could really feel like I could fit in and I met some wonderful people who still help me to this day. And that private school <laughs> really taught me a lot. Um, I remember my one teacher who was our cooking class, our math teacher, and our art teacher. She was so awesome. <laughs> she was sort of like another grandma to me. She treated all of us kids, all of her students, as if they were grandkids. She really invested in our future. She didn't just teach. She, when our personal finance class portion of the math came up, she quite literally did a life version of Monopoly where we each got a job, we could buy a car from each other. We were each a business owner. I was in charge of cars. One of my good friends there, his job was to um, sell apartments to us and to collect rent and stuff like that. And between me and him, <laughs> we kind of monopolized on each other and um, basically could make our own prices, which we got in trouble for at school <laughs> when she found out what we were doing, even though that's exactly what happens in real life. She wanted it to be fair. And... It was just so much fun to, yeah, we may have gotten in trouble, but she ended up using it as a lesson in real life. Things don't go fair all the time. And um, at least we got to keep our money, money. It was completely fake, all of it. Fake checks, fake everything. Um, but we did that for a couple of months. Um... It was really fun, but it really brought to point the fact that she really was taking care of us. She wasn't 
just going through the book and saying, oh, here's what you do, this is what happens, the end. She would make entire binders of worksheets for us that while we are going through our lessons, we would write down words and things and she'd have us write their definitions and write examples. She would really try to get it so that way in the future we can look back at it and say, oh, I remember this. Oh, I remember that. That's how you do it. Okay, that makes more sense. And things like that. It was so cool to see her do this. And this came out of her own pocket. This wasn't school bought or anything like that. She did this all on her own. And it really meant a lot to at least most of us. Um, she was just such an amazing teacher. And my other teacher that I really liked, she was our English literature and I can't remember what other subject she did. But anyway, um, she was the fastest reader I've ever met. She could read an entire page of Harry Potter to you in like 15 seconds. I mean, it was ridiculously fast. And she had this, there was this one student that would just drive her nuts. Those two clashed so much. And she had this thing that on her head, she had like a vein right here. And every time those two got in a fight, fight, an argument, clash, that vein would stand out. <laughs> and it was so funny to see it. And you could always tell on the next class, because I wasn't in that class, but you could always tell when those two got in a clash that day because you'd go in there and that vein would be standing out. And she would just have this look on her face like, if you mess with me, so help me. I don't care if I go to prison, I will kill you. <laughs> Uh, but she was awesome. She really helped me with my reading. Um, she suggested books after book after book that I should read. And it was just such an amazing experience to be in both of those two class. And to be honest, I miss them. Out of all the teachers, I think those two are the ones I miss the most. Uh, my two other teachers were my geology, earth science. Uh, he was in charge of all the sciences, which was like three or so of them. Chemistry, physics, and earth science. Um, he was also in charge of, well, he was in charge of PE for a while there. Um, but then I got switched to the fourth teacher. Anyway, um, so he was in charge of all of the sciences, everything science. Um, me and him clashed, same as the other kid and that teacher. Me and him clashed. Um, but he was pretty cool. Um, I really admire him now that I look back, even if we did get in some arguments. He really had the best hope for us. Um, he really invested his time into us. And he would try to make the learning as hands-on as possible. Um, and my other teacher, <laughs> he was an old guy. I'm guessing, I don't know, 70, 80 possibly. Probably not that old, but he seemed like it sometimes. Maybe 60. But he was, he got switched when he got hired on. PE got switched to him, and he also took over computers, um, doing all of our computer stuff. And um, let's just say that guy can run. <laughs> I never, you never would have expected it from him if you saw him, but he 
<laughs> he could race laps around us kids. Um, especially me. But he never did. He was more of a distance runner, but... So he would jog with us during our PE when we were doing laps. Instead of just sitting there waiting for us, he would jog with us. And um, it was really cool to see someone actually being part of the PE instead of just coaching. He was actually doing it with us. During our basketball, he would come in and join the game. He would... Um, just anything we were doing, any PE activity, he was part of it. Um, and he was just in great shape. And during our computer classes, he was always willing to answer our questions. Um, and he had this thing where on the board, occasionally he would purposely make a mistake just to see if someone would catch it. Um, and if someone did, he would give them a sugar cube to suck on, and which was always fun. Um, all of us kids would fight every morning to be the first one in, so you'd have the highest chance of spotting the mistake. And then on our quizzes, if we got 100%, uh, we would get a sugar cube. And... Um, I remember one day <laughs> he did the quiz and I think all but one got a hundred percent on their quiz. And when he went to pull out the sugar cubes, he realized he was out. <laughs> and so he went up front to the candy machine and I got like a hand, giant handful of, if I remember correctly, M&Ms and gave them to us and said, Sorry, I'm out of sugar cubes, so here's this. Um, it was really interesting. <laughs> he was so funny. Um, but he was really awesome. So from about the age of eight, I was in therapies off and on uh, between in-program, out-program, um, anger management classes, pretty much everything up until about the age of 18. Maybe 17, I think is actually when I ended. Um, and I was in and out of facilities to try to help me with my anger, my disabilities, because I have ADHD, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, um, ADD, um, ODD, um, anxiety, depression. I have a lot. I have it all. <laughs> but most of those programs, I would fake my way through. I would act like I was okay. And therefore, they would say I was doing good. And they would send me home, even though I wasn't treated. And I wasn't doing any better. Um, but that private school I went to that I lived in, um, was also a in-home therapy, um, sort of. I lived at the schoolish facility where I received schooling and I received therapy the rest of the day. Um, not all of it, but a good at least two or three hours a day, every day, Monday through Sunday. It was very intense. It was a very long time, like I said, two years. For a year of it, I tried to do my normal faking my way through. I almost succeeded, but about Maybe a month before I probably would have succeeded, I screwed up and I went back to my old ways and they realized that I was faking my way through and so did I. Um, and 
me and my therapist sat down for a good three hours, three to four hours, and he basically said, you know what? If you want to change, you got to do this. If you want to become a better person, you have to do this. No one's going to do it for you. And I think that's about the time where it dawned on me, I really do need to change. I can't keep faking my way through life. I can't keep faking my way through this therapy. I'm going to have to sit down and do it. I'm going to have to buckle up, endure the ride, and get through it and become a better person. And I did. For the next year, again, I went through starting therapy completely over, and I went through it all over again. And... I got to about the same point where I was the time um, when I screwed up and I went to my peers to ask for what we call a level advancement, which is um, where you go from, I think I was going from level four to level five. And level five is where you start preparing to go back home, go back into the real world. Um, and they were concerned, which I don't blame them for. They were concerned that I was faking it again. And I realized that no matter how much I try to prove it, I couldn't because I screwed up already. But with good faith, they advanced me and I was able to start preparing to come home. I finished that level. About that time is when I graduated six months early. It was actually both my graduation from school and the therapy system that, um, and my parents came down from Tooele to come to that, and I was able to go home. It was a very incredible experience being there because it really changed me. I was learned to control my disabilities to the point where even now, back when I was there, I was on two, I think, two to three medications on pretty decent doses. Um, now I am on one medication with the smallest dose. And it's just been an amazing experience to see the difference that from before therapy to therapy now. Um, if people saw me before I went to therapy, they would, if they were to describe me, they would say spoiled brat, selfish, rude, arrogant, just all sorts of horrible things. And for those of them have, that have seen me that way and have seen me now, most of them can't believe the change. They're always complimenting me on how much I've changed. Um, even my parents now, they can still see the growth that I've taken on. And it's been really helpful to go through that program and it was a lifesaver because if I hadn't gone through there I don't know where I'd be today it was just so such a miracle in my life so when I got home um, I needed to start work and I realized this is going to be a lot more difficult than I thought. Because um, everywhere I wanted, wanted ex everywhere that I wanted to apply, wanted experience. As my first job, I had none. So I went to a program called LIFE, L-Y-F-E, um, Lifting Youth something something. And um, they helped me. Um, take some tests to find out what my strengths are. They um, 
suggested some jobs and they told me that if I can find someone to do an internship with, a, it would be a paid internship where the, the people would pay me and then this program would pay them back. And so I went around to a couple places. Most people said no, that they just can't do it. But I went to the UPS store in my hometown, Tooele, and um, I talked to the manager there, the owner, and um, they seemed interested. So I told them that I'd set up an appointment to meet with the person from the LIFE program to go over some more details. And I started a paint internship a couple weeks later. Um, it was a very interesting job. It was really fun. Um, I got to meet a lot of people. Got to help a lot of people with their packaging, with their work. Um, I remember this one lady came in. She needed a printing job. And it was a diabetic book of to write down what their numbers are for their diabetes. And <laughs> she was trying to make 20 books, if I remember correctly out of one, so she had to print 20 copies of each and every page because um, it was a year's worth, so it was January 1st through the 7th and so on. And I remember I helped her with that project, and that project took us a good 45 to almost an hour's worth of work. Um, but it was really interesting. I got to talk to her the entire time. She was a really cool lady. Um, and she just couldn't <laughs> couldn't afford to get the books. So she was trying to find a cheaper way and found out that it would be cheaper to go through us. Um, so that was very fun to help her. And one night we were bored because it was our dead time of the day and the dead time of our week. And um, this was right after Frozen came out with Let It Go. And so we decided to do a Snapchat video of us skipping through the store while singing Let It Go. Yeah, we were all pretty ridiculous that day. <laughs> but it was so much fun to do it with them. Um, and they were just such a cool group to work with, all of my coworkers. Um, it was just such a good experience. It was supposed to be a three month paid internship, but due to lack of work and trying to get her employees the hours, she just couldn't keep me around. So after a month and a half of working there, they had to release me early from the internship. But it was experience and it allowed me to start getting other jobs. So my next job I was looking for, I was reading the newspaper and the wanted ads. And I found a ad for a company called Flyer Smiles. Now I wish I had burned that newspaper, but... Um, I decided to go in and apply, and I did, and they set up an interview. I walked in. He said, do you want the job? I said, yeah. He said, okay, go look at what they're doing and come back and tell me you want it again. So I did, and it looked pretty decent, not hard. Basically, we just called people in Australia and asked if they had needed any flights planned, and if they did, that we were that we would take their information and we would try to find them a really cheap flight. Um, and so I went back in and I said, sure, I'll take it. And he says, okay, I'll see you tomorrow at this time. What sucks is me and my mom had prepared probably a good three to four hours of interview skills, um, information about the company, different things to impress them so I could get my, this job. And I went in and he basically gave me the job and I used none of it. 
which really made my mom mad because she really put in a lot of hard work to try to help me. <laughs> but um, it was a commission job. My first day, I earned $5 for six hours of work. I earned $5. My second day, not much better. Five bucks, 10 bucks, that's about it. So it went on like that for a couple of weeks. I was hoping maybe if I got the skills, I could pick things up and start learning. But when I talked to a bunch of the other workers, I found out some of them weren't doing much better. In fact, I think only one was doing better than that and not by much. So one night, <laughs> my boss came in and um, I was on a streak that day. I don't know what happened, why I was happy to call all the good people, but I had already earned like 40 bucks that day. Um, and he came in, he says, okay, I just got some concert tickets to this concert that's gonna happen. It was a really big concert. Bunch of country stars were coming, Reba, um, Tim McGraw, all of them were coming. Uh, and my favorite band, country band, Florida Georgia Line, was going to be there. And he said, anyone who went, whoever earns the most money today will get this. We'll get these two tickets to this concert. And I was like, I looked at the board to show how much we've earned, and I was smoking everybody. And I'm like, oh, I've got this. So I continued to work, and I was still on a streak. It was awesome. I ended up walking out that day, six hours of work with $80, $89, if I remember correctly. It was a good, really, really good day. And two tickets. And I went home, and I told my stepmom about it. And she was so shocked, because she... And so... We went the next night. I took the next three nights off so I could go to this concert because it was a th four night, but the first night was the night I earned them. And by the time I was done, the concert was over for the first part. So I missed Reba. Darn it. Anyway, so we went in the next day. Me and my, mom, my stepmom went to the concert. And... Um, I went and... We went around to the little booths and stuff beforehand, got a drink, got some nachos, the usual that you do at a concert festival thing. And I went up to this army booth and they were doing a raffle for backstage passes. And I said, oh, I might as well enter that. So I filled out a paper, put it in, didn't think about it ever again, knew I wasn't gonna win. Anyway, so about Three weeks to a month later, I get a phone call. It's from the Army. And they're saying that I've won a guitar that has been signed by all the people there. Reba, Tim McGraw, Florida Georgia, Toby Keith, and all of the sub-artists that were there. And I was so shocked. This was like a $4,000 guitar now that has been signed by everyone. So I went and picked it up, it was cool, and I brought it into work the next day, showed it off, um, said, went and thanked my boss, said, thanks for the tickets, I just won three to $4,000 guitar, um, which he was mad about because he wanted to go to the concert, but he couldn't. Um, it was just such a cool experience. I got my picture taken, uh, got put, got posted on their Facebook page. Um, it was so cool. I still have the guitar. Still can't play it. Um, but that was about the only good thing that happened at that job. Otherwise, I like I said, I earned about $5 a day. Um, I About three weeks in later... My boss got fired, and one of our coworkers, who was probably the stupidest decision of all of us, got put as boss. Three months later, the company was shut down. Um, or at least that segment of the company. 
out into a um but right as soon as he got put as boss i think i was there a week more and then i quit i just was making nothing we were doing nothing he was sending us home early not giving us our hours to try to earn our commission um nothing it just was a terrible job but that was the one thing like i said that happened good the rest of it was pretty bad my bo- my first boss was pretty cool he'd give us incentives occasionally he would say oh um next person who makes a flight deal gets 5 extra dollars or something um or at least gets their information for the flight deal would get 5 extra dollars or something just to try to help us out try to get us the encouragement he was really cool i'm still in touch with him he's um doing good right now he's got a new job um but i kind of had to laugh cuz i went to the main company called him and i said you know this company is going to go south with him as boss and um that was actually the day i quit and they said oh no it'll do great we think he'll be do good and like i said 3 months later they were shut down it went that bad <laughs> anyway it was really interesting job and i learned australians have some really interesting cuss words and have really bad potty mouths so yeah so my next job i went for i was talking with my bishop and he suggested i should go apply for this job at detroit diesel um it's a remanufacturing we take old truck parts mixed with new parts and we rebuild engines um well at least we we rebuilt the turbines and built new engines um and it was really hard work i've i worked there for about a year and a half before um i had to quit for my mission um lots of great people but it was really hard work there was a lot of heavy lifting standing on your feet for quite literally 8 hours in one spot um it was very annoying it was loud um you pretty much had to wear ear protection pretty much through 3 quarters of the building um and um there was constantly the fear of getting hurt um in fact i like the way one of my <laughs> people in my ward who also worked there put it he was to the point where he was saying how hard do i have to crash my car into that pole to not have to go into work today um and but it was it was a good job it paid good um in fact i would have gone back there but i don't think i will now i think i found a couple other jobs that i'd rather do um but it it was a very cool experience we i learned a lot about trucks there in fact that's why i'm one of the reasons why i'm working on getting my cdl so i can possibly become a truck driver um it was quite the experience um one of my bosses did not like me very much she was very hard on me and very lenient on the others i think part of it is because she's sexist because <laughs> I was the only boy in that area surprisingly at a Detroit diesel remanufacturing diesel place in that specific area we I was the only boy there and I think that's part of the reason why she was very hard on me um still don't know but that's just my guess my 
second boss was really cool. She was very accepting of pretty much everyone. She tried to get along with us. She really didn't seem, I wouldn't say like a boss, more as a, as she was our boss, so we did have to listen to her and stuff, but she tried to be more of a friend to us. She tried to get to know us, talk about our lives, um, try to be a part of our group instead of trying to make it seem like she's above us. She was really cool that way. And I worked in two places at Detroit. I worked in the parts department and I also worked in cleaning. Uh, I first worked in parts. Um, so that's where I grabbed all of the different parts that they needed in order to build the engines. Um, I would grab these giant carts that were like seven feet tall, um, filled with bins and racks that you can put stuff on, all sorts of stuff. And I'd go and I'd grab pretty much everything that they needed to build the engine, other than maybe the biggest pieces. Anyway, um, it was very cool to see all the different pieces. Um, I worked a couple different areas in that department. I worked as one of the people that took the carts around to grab all the pieces. I was in charge of the bulk parts, which was more of bolts, um, nuts, washers, things like that, that they needed, clamps, all that small, tiny stuff. Um, and I was in charge of that area. So if they needed something, like I think a couple times a bolt broke, um, they would call me over the radio and say, hey, I need this bolt. I'd go give it to them an extra one. Uh, I was also in charge of charging out the engines off of the computer system, making sure our inventory was correct, things like that. Um, I worked on that right before I moved over to cleaning. In cleaning, what we did is we took all of the old engines that came in that had gone bad, were rusty, carbon-filled, junk, and we would clean them up, make them new, um, or take the parts off and try to make them look as new as possible. We'd remanufacture them. Um, if they were slightly broken, sometimes we could repair them, depending on what it was. Um, and it was really hard work there. That was the part where you had to stand on your feet in one spot for eight hours because you'd have your hands in a machine getting all the rust, all the grease, all the oil, all the um, carbon out of it and try to get that clean so we can um, re-chemically um, cover it and send it through to be reused. It was quite an interesting process. We had quite a few different ways to do it, depending on what the part was, how many, things like that, depends on what machine we would use. Um, but it was, it was pretty okay work. It was really hard, but, and my feet hurt every day. But I, there was a lot of really cool people and you could talk if you could hear each other. Um, and when I first started, they were doing four, ten, four, ten hour days, which was awesome. So I got my Fridays off, but then they switched to the five, eight hour days again, which sucked. No one liked it. Um, but it was, it was work and it got me the money that I needed to go on my mission. Um, and so in February or January of 2016, I quit and started my mission. So because I'm overweight quite a bit, um, I could not go on a proselyting mission. And I knew that uh, um, if I was to try to lose the weight in order to go on my proselyting mission, I was going to be another two to three years. 
it was going to take me quite a while to lose that weight. Because I'd also have to change life habits, lifestyles, the works. And so, and I didn't want to wait that long to go on my mission. So I talked with my bishop and my stake president. And after a while of deliberating, we found out about a program called the YCSM program or the Young Church Service Missionary Program. Um, I had never heard of it, neither had my stake president nor my um, bishop have ever heard of it, um, or at least as far as I'm aware. Anyway, uh, the people that were in charge of this program came and they talked to me. They shared a couple of places that I could go and serve my mission. And when I found out I get to choose where I go, I was really excited. I was figured I could go and I could find the best place for me and I could choose to go there. I wouldn't be left up to chance and up to the spirit to guide me. But I went to a place called the Bishop Central Storehouse. It's in Salt Lake. Um, and I walked in and I knew that this is where I was going to serve. I knew right away, I could feel it, I could feel the Spirit telling me, this is where you are going to serve. This is where we need you. And I went on a tour there. I met some of the elders that were already there. And that very day, I set up saying, hey, okay, this is where I want to go. And uh, my parents tried to get me to go on a couple other tours, but I said, nope. And so we went home, and a couple weeks later, on February 29th of 2016, on Leap Year Day, um, Leap Day, I started, which was stupid of me. Because <laughs> if, if we were going by date, I would have to serve a eight-year mission if I wanted a full do a full two years, but we didn't go by date. Um, so I went, uh, served a f one year mission there. Um, it was very awesome. The storehouse is a 56,000 um, square foot building um, with three different sections. We have our bulk storage, our what we call our pick-in, which is where we go box by box of what all the storehouses need. Um, and then we have our cooler freezer area. And the purpose of this facility is, so all the Bishop storehouses across the nation in the U.S. and Canada, we supply um, all of the food that they have, all of the products that they have, they get straight from us. Um, so if they need paper towel, or not paper towels, toilet paper, they would call us up and say, hey, we need an order of toilet paper to go with our other orders. And so they would say, okay, we'll add this to your truck. And then when their truck was filled, we would send their truck to them across the nation whatever, however long it, distance it was, whether it's in-state, out-of-state, um, whatever. And um, we were also in charge of a lot of the relief aid that goes into natural disasters such as floods, um, fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, things like that. If those hit, we would send relief effort out to them, we would send wheelbarrows, axes, chainsaws, um, and for the very, very rare case, which is a very sad thing, we did have body bags, which we would always threaten each other. All the elders would tease each other saying, don't make me go grab a body bag and use it on you. <laughs> um, but and then we would do special projects um, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but it was such a cool experience. The BCS, the Bishop Central Storehouse, was 
just such an awesome mission. Um, and it's for those that can't serve a proselyting mission for some reason or another. Some of us had mental disabilities. Um, some were overweight like me. Um, and some just didn't have the social skills and capabilities to be able to go out and to teach people. Um, so they found out about this program and they came to serve there. So one of the cool facts about this specific mission is the fact that every month we get to go to a new temple. Um, we have not new, but a different temple than the last month. So we have about eight different temples, eight to nine different temples that we went to during my one year service there. Uh, we went to the Logan, um, Payson, Salt Lake, Ogden, all sorts of different temples. Um, and got to serve there to do our baptisms for the dead, um, initiatories, endowment sessions, all sorts of fun things there. Um, it was a very cool experience to be able to go every month. Um, and we also did our family history ourselves. So all the names that we took to the temple, we did ourselves. And if we didn't have enough, then we would um, have some of the dock workers that had names, people that worked at the BCS that weren't missionaries. They would give us their family names that they hadn't done, and we would do them for them. Um, and occasionally we'd have to do a couple temple because we were out of names, which in our case was a good thing because that means we were keeping up with what we were producing. Um, and it was such a wonderful experience to be able to go to all the different temples. And when we would go to the temples, we, a lot of the time we would have like a little tour of something or another around the area. Like the last temple I went to before the end of my mission, we went to the Union Pacific Railroad Museum and got to see all the different trains and also the Browning Gun Museum that was at the same building. We got to see all of that, all the different guns throughout time and history of that. It was really cool to um, get on some of the cabooses. And I. this was our second time going there. We went towards the beginning of my mission. We went on a tour there. And in one of the cabooses, we took a picture a few of us elders together um, up in one of the carts in one of the little lookout positions things and we were able to reenact it um, again with some slight variations because some of the elders had gone already had finished their mission so we had to substitute but it was really cool to have all of us there um, to be able to take the pictures. Um, so my very first day of my mission, I walked in, it was a Monday, and every Monday we have a little meeting um, in a conference room with all the dock workers, all of the office workers, and all of the missionaries. And we would have a little devotional, have a prayer, song, spiritual thought and stuff. And I walked in, sat down with all the other missionaries, and one of the missionaries came up to me and asked me, have you ever watched Ruby? And I hadn't, and I had no idea what he was talking about. So I said, no, I don't even know what that is. And so he continued to explain it to me until the start of our devotional. And at first I thought it sounded kind of weird like not something I would be very into necessarily. Anyway, so after our devotional, uh, we went into our missionary room where we got our work assignment for the day. Um, I actually got placed with him that day and we talked about Ruby for pretty much the rest of the day and I asked questions 
trying really just to be polite. But towards the end of the day, I kind of actually started to get interested in it. And um, so a couple of days later, I decided, fine, I'll watch this show. And for those of you that don't know, Ruby is called an anime. Um, it's a sort of Japanese, more styled show. Uh, it's really cool, even though it's based in the in the U.S. Um, it's a really awesome show. I really came to love it. Um, anyway, so a couple of days later, I started watching it. Got done with the first season. Got done with the second season. There was three seasons out at the time. And I came up to him the next day and I said, I just watched two seasons in a row in one day. <laughs> and he laughed and he was like, yeah, I know, it's that good. And so we started talking about it. And at the end of that day, um, I went home and I binge watched the third season. Which made me really mad. Because <laughs> there was a lot of shockers in that third season that really put a damper on things. But also really got me more into it. Anyway, so I went back the next day. I got placed with him again. And... Um, we started talking about Ruby and found out that a bunch of the elders were had also watched it and really liked it and they had a OC going on which is an original character game uh, where you make up your own character from the world that the original thing is coming from and you pretend like you're actually in it what your character would be doing what your character is like um, and things like that and he asked if I wanted to join and I thought about it and I said sure yeah I'll join so I created my first OC character um, and pretty much the rest of my mission me and this elder became best friends and um, we got to really get to know each other quite well um, and our OC characters uh, really became close and um, we had a lot of fun adventures with our OC characters but it really brought all of us elders together gave us a common thing um, between us uh, really gave us something that we could talk about um, and so we'd mix that between the gospel. Um, so when we weren't when we weren't talking about scripture, we were talking about that. Um, it was very fun to be around them and to um be able to do this OCD game with them, which ended up taking a way bigger turn than what was originally intended. We ended up bringing other worlds into it and giving our characters way too much power. And it was really fun, though. Um, we had this huge final battle right before I left. And so now the OC characters are kind of on their separate missions right now. Separate missions until we can get back together, possibly later on. And bring them back together um but it was really fun really gave us something in common and gave us a reason to enjoy each other's company more gave us something to solidify our bond um and it was just such a cool experience such a great show and because of that i have watched many other animes um, and we've incorporated those into our OC and it's been really cool to do that with them. We also at this mission did other service projects. We did things like 
um, make food boxes for the flood victims um, that were down in Louisiana when that hurricane, I think it was a hurricane hit, maybe. Maybe it was just flooding, but anyway. Um, and we helped make food boxes for, I think there was some earthquake victims that we helped with some things. Um, we just did a whole bunch of these special projects for different people that needed help, different, well, and programs. Like one of them that is called the Eyes of, Zimbab yeah. Eyes of Zimbabwe program, um, where a whole bunch of stuff was donated to this program. They brought it to the BCS and a bunch of us elders sorted through it, got all the pants in one group, shirts in another, school supplies, um, shoes, paper products, feminine hygiene, all, all of it, just separated it, put it into these giant shipping containers and to the point where you couldn't fit a penny in there. We packed that thing, all these shipping containers tight because it was charged per container, not by weight, luckily. And so we packed everything we possibly could in there. Um, and then those got shipped to the shipping yard and got sent to Zimbabwe to help the people there in need. Um, and we got some pictures back from Zimbabwe of our products getting there that we helped with. And to see some of the faces of the people that received our service, uh, which was a very rare thing for us at the Bishop Central Storehouse. Because the Bishop Central Storehouse is more of a behind the scenes facility. We don't get those that are in need to come to us. They go to the storehouses, which get their stuff from us. So that link is never really brought up. But so we never got to see the help that we were giving. Um, but through these special projects and through like we, like the eyes from Zimbabwe through the pictures, we really got to see the impact that we were making with these people. And we got to see all the different things that were out there, all the different opportunities to serve. Um, and it was such a great experience to have. Um, it really brought into focus what our purpose of the mission was. It wasn't to try to feel accomplished or anything like that. It was to serve the Lord and to serve the people that he wants us to. Um, and it was such a special experience to be able to see the, the smiles on those kids' faces as they received a pair of shoes that for all of us, for a lot of us, we wouldn't care. We'd be like, oh, great, old shoes, who cares? But for them, it was like having Christmas all over again. Um, it was such a special experience to see that and to realize there are people out there that need our help and we are here to help them. And that's what part of the storehouse is all about, helping those that need it. So at the mission, we have once every other month, sometimes once every month, um, a day that we take off from the mission to really bond as companions and missionaries. Um, we go to a stake center, uh, a chapel, a church, and we um, basically just play games and laugh, enjoy each other's company. Um, we normally order pizza from Little Caesars. Um, and we play some sports, play kickball, basketball, things like that with each other. Really just get to know each other more. Um, it, it's such a fun day. Um, we all look forward to it. Gives us a break from the monotony of the, our work, which I'll tell you what we do in a little bit. Um, it's such wonderful times that I remember having there. Um, like last sports day before I left, we started a thing called Path, um, Pathfinders. 
It's a game sort of like Dungeons and Dragons for those of you who know that. It's a role-playing game where you have a character that you've created and you move through different scenarios um, and fight different creatures, um, earn gold, um, have special abilities, special powers, things like that, fantasy-based stuff. And you get to, and it really brought us together as well as the Ruby OC. It really brought our mission together closely. And we continued that every lunch and every break during our day at the mission. Um, and it was just such an awesome experience to be able to get to know the the other elders through their characters as well. Really get to know what they think, how they feel, things like that. It was such a cool experience. At the mission, we had different job assignments every day. Um, some of those assignments are cycle counting, which is um, our inventory, making sure all of our products are there, making sure we have the right numbers. Um, we have dust mopping because the Bishop Central Storehouse is dedicated ground. It is um, very sacred, and w all of us missionaries are charged with um, making sure that it's clean um, up to temple standards, um, making sure that we're doing what we need to to keep the place going, keep it running smoothly, um, try to help as many people as we can, as efficiently as we can. Um, and so our job was to make sure the facility was clean. So along with our inventory, we had dust mops that we would push around and collect all the broken pallet pieces, the dust, the dirt, things like that, keep our floors as clean as possible. Um, we also had machines called scrubbers, which are basically, how to put it, sort of like a golf cart sized vehicle that goes down the aisles of the pallets and scrubs the floor, gets all of the dirt and debris up and dust and any spills that happen to happen. Um, we can clean those up um, and make sure the floors are clean. We also vacuum things out, um, vacuum the dust off of the racks, vacuum the offices, except for we don't do that. That's the cleaner's jobs, but um, it was just so, there's so much to do there. So much work that pretty much most days we had a different assignment than the previous day. Very rarely did we have to do the same assignment twice. Um, and it was just such a cool experience to do all the different jobs that they have there. I got trained, I believe, on every single job that is possibly there. Um, and there's just so much to do. And sometimes, yeah, it can get pretty boring when you do the same generic jobs over and over and over and over every day. Um, but it's still pretty, pretty cool to see all the rackings, all the racks of food and supplies, boxes of everything that a person can need, toilet paper, canned beans, everything, which is so cool. And we got to make sure that all that stuff stayed stay safe by us keeping the facility clean. So when I was four years old, my parents got a divorce. It was very rough on me. I don't remember too much of it. I've blocked most of my memories of that time out. Um, it was a very rough period in my life from then up until I was 15, 16. I had a lot of troubles. 
Um, the divorce really hit me hard. Um, and because of it, my mom and I moved up to Oregon. So we moved up to Oregon because my, um, uh, most of my family lived up there. My mom's, um, sisters and brothers lived there. And we lived there for about, I want to say about five to six years we lived there. Um, it was very interesting, very cold, very wet. Um, I live right next to the St. John's Bridge, right next to the river, and I had a lot of struggles there. Like I said, I was from a freshly divorced parents. I didn't get along with just about anyone. Um, I was in a special ed class. I just had a really hard time, and after about four or five years of living there, most of my family moved back down to Utah from to their origin, and me and my mom were left up there alone because I was a troublemaker, and I wasn't the best kid. My mom decided we needed to move somewhere where she could have family support. And so we decided we didn't want to move down to Utah because that's where my dad lived. And those two don't get along, so we moved to Idaho. So we moved to Idaho because my mom's birth family is from here, is from Idaho. Well, actually, they're from Montana, but they moved down to Idaho. And we lived with my grandma for about a week or two before we found a house that we rented for most of my time in Idaho. Um, it was, I was doing better. I was working through a lot of my problems. I was getting therapy help. Um, it wasn't working too great though. I really wasn't wanting to change because in my mind, nothing was wrong. Um, but there were some good times there. We lived about three or four blocks from a farmer's market that would come every summer. And there would be a lot of fun things going on there. And so me and mom would go down there. Or sometimes I would go down there. And just have fun there. Go see all the booths. Sample all the foods. Um and go check out all the jewelry. Um, it was such an interesting experience living in Idaho. It wasn't as cold as Oregon, still cold. Um, I doubt I'll ever live somewhere warm enough, but um, it was very interesting living in Idaho and Pocatello. Um, I didn't have very many friends. I didn't really get along with a lot of people. The only people I really ever hung out with were my cousins who lived about four houses down. Actually, I think it was two. But um, And even then, we didn't get along all that great. And yeah, that's pretty much Idaho in a nutshell. So when I was 14, possibly 15, uh, the divorce decree changed. I moved down to go with my dad um, and my stepmom, um, who from now on I'm just gonna call mom because she is my second mom. Um, so it may get slightly confusing. But me and her really hit it off good. Um, she's been a great influence in my life. Um, she's been so great. And 
when I moved down to Utah, um, yeah, when I moved down to Utah, it was very difficult for me to change from living with my mom to living with my dad. Um, I had to learn a lot about my dad. I had to learn a lot about dealing with some of the problems of Utah, <laughs> especially since we lived out in the middle of nowhere of great old Tooele, where there is very little to do unless you want to go to Walmart. Um, but it was still pretty cool. And it was right about that time that I got into some trouble and I moved down to Cedar City to go to school and to get some therapy help. And I have been living in Tula ever since I got back from the therapy and have been working, um, doing a little bit of dating, having some fun, um, trying, finishing my mission, uh, just finished that. Now I'm starting to go back to work. So when I was in Idaho, my, both my parents, my um, mom and my dad got remarried to my stepdad and my stepmom. Um, it was difficult to bring in two new parents. It's still hard sometimes. Um, I try to accept both of them as my parents um cuz they are they're my second dad and my second mom but sometimes it's still hard especially when i disagree with them <laughs> um but they're still awesome they really stepped up to the plate to help me um with my life and my struggles they've accepted me for who i am um and they've been there for me ever since. For most of my life, I have wanted a little brother or sister, but knowing that my mom and or my dad was probably never gonna get remarried, I kind of stopped hoping for that. And when my dad and my stepmom got remarried, I was excited. Um, and a little while later, I found out my stepmom was pregnant with my little sister, Desi. Um, I still remember the night that I was waiting for the phone call saying that they were, that my sister had been born. Um, it was probably, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night before, it was late at night. I don't remember exactly what time, but... Um, that the phone rang. I had been way past my bedtime. Um, my bedtime was at nine and I know I was way past that. Um, basically sitting there staring at the phone when it rained, I practically jumped out of my skin because it scared me. <laughs> um, but I ran to the phone, picked it up. Sure enough, it was my dad saying that I now had a little sister. And I was scared, I'm not gonna lie. I'd been most of my life without anyone. I was scared of having a little sister um, and slightly jealous of the lack of attention I was getting. Um, I'll admit it. But she, she's she been one of the best things that's ever happened to me. I love her with all my heart. She has Down syndrome. Um, she's such a special little girl. She has got so much spunk. It's she's got such a great personality. It's ridiculous. She drives me nuts. Sometimes I just want to lock her in her room, but I know that if I do, I'll get in trouble and it's never worth it. But I love her with everything I have. She means the world to me. She's She's my little sis. She's the best. Um, and she's she's going to be such a wonderful little girl. 
when she grows up, she's going to be a wonderful young lady. And I feel so bad for the guy she decides to marry. <laughs> He's going to have a handful with her. Um, but she's just the best thing ever. No, no one could have replaced her. And I'm so glad she decided to come to my family to be with my mom and my dad. So for my hobbies, I have three, four main ones. Um, I have my favorite video game, Pokemon. It's also my favorite sh TV show, um, but not by much. <laughs> um, I love playing the video games of Pokemon. I own quite a few of them. Or I did until I sold them. Um, I love talking about it. I love the theories, uh, watching YouTube theories on it, uh, learning stats on Pokemon, all sorts, pretty much anything Pokemon other than the card game. I don't like the card game. Uh, I collect cards, but I don't play the card game. Um... But it's just such a fun thing. I love talking to people about it. And yes, Charizard is the best Pokemon out there. Any of you who disagree are wrong. Um, it's such a fun game. Um, such a fun fandom. Um, and it's just such a wonderful thing. My second favorite um, hobby is my Yu-Gi-Oh! collection. I play the card game, and I also watch the TV show. Um, it's a card game that I really love, way better than Pokemon's card game. It's been such a blessing in my life. Um, it's really brought me closer to people outside of my family and school friends. Um, it's brought me so much joy to be able to go to the game shops and play for hours on end with other people who have the same fun experiences I have with it. Um, I collect the cards. I love to um, build decks with them to test new things out, um, to do all sorts of fun things with it. Um, and it's just been such a great part of my life to be able to play this game to really bring out my inner inner little child in a way I love playing with other people this game um, and to watch the show it's been just such a great show and great series um, still watching it still haven't finished but it's been so great I love to read. That is by far probably my most time-consuming thing other than maybe sleeping. But anyway, I love to sleep and I love to read. <laughs> um, I love to read fantasy fiction. Uh, my favorite author would probably have to be Brandon Mole author of the Fable Haven series, the Candy Shop War, and the Beyonder series. Um, he's such a great author. I love his work. I love how he always throws in these little tricks and things. Um, I love um, this new series that I'm reading called Mistborn. It's been such a great series so far. I'm on the second book. Um, I just love to read just a, most about anything. Um, I hate art books, things like that, college books, textbooks, things like that. Um, I'm not big into documentary books or um, biographies. I'm more into fiction, fantasy, and occasionally I like a few other books. But if it has dragons in it, it's probably good. Um, I just love reading and 
because it really brings me to another world. It allows me to escape the frustrations and the struggles of this world and um, helps me to calm myself, to be able to deal with my problems. Um, and it really helps me to gather information about things. Um, and it's just such an awesome thing. I love, and it was really up to my teachers and my stepmom that really brought me my reading. I love to read because of them, and it's been such an awesome experience. So my fourth hobby is I make jewelry. I know I'm a guy, and yes, I make jewelry. I have a very strong feminine side. I love to go to Joanne's Arts and Crafts store. I love talking about girly things. Uh, but I love to make jewelry. I make some beautiful necklaces. Uh, necklaces are my specialty. Uh, my mom is a great watchmaker um, or watch band maker. Uh, we love to make jewelry together. We haven't done a whole lot lately. I did a few necklaces like a month ago, um, but I really just do it for fun. People keep telling me I should sell my necklaces. Occasionally I'll do some trades where I'll trade one service for another. Um, but most of the time I'd give my necklaces away um, to people that I really care about. Um, it's something I love to do for fun. It's a stress reliever for me. It gets my mind off of the problems of today and gets me focusing one beat at a time, one pendant at a time, um, one thing of thread at a time. Um, and it really lets me focus on one small detail and helps me to understand all of the different components that go into one necklace. Also helps me to understand all the different components that go into life. Um, I know it sounds weird, but it it's true. Um, but I also love to, just the simplicity of it for me is um, finding different patterns and things come easily to me. And so building a necklace that I've never seen before, never seen anything like it, easy for me to do. And I love doing it. And I'm not afraid to say that I'm a guy and I make jewelry. So I love to listen to music. Again, as same with books and jewelry making. It brings me away from this world and bring me, brings me into another. I think my favorite band that really, my first one at least, was ABBA from the 80s. Um... Take a Chance on Me was one of my favorites, along with um, Dancing Queen, were probably my two favorite songs. Um, growing up, I used to listen to them all the time. Um, and recently, I got to see a ABBA impersonation concert. It was really fun to go to. Um, and my sister even got a signed album or CD from them. It was really cool. Uh, I always loved their group. I still love their music, even though now my style has changed. Um, but I still love them. So my second favorite artist that I've come to like is Katy Perry. Um, I love how she's... She writes her own music, um, how she really loves to express herself um, through her music videos and through her music themselves, the lyrics. Um, and I love how she really how do I put it? Brings the music to life. 
She doesn't just write random song lyrics like some artists do. Hers have a purpose. Um, she means things by her lyrics. And those meanings have really come through for me. Um, and it's really brought me some peace of mind. And of course, her songs are very catchy. Um, I love Dark Horse and Roar. Um, Roar is actually me and my stepmom's theme song together. Every time it comes on the radio, me and her are blaring it. Um, even if we get strange looks from people in other cars, it's something that we do. It's fun, it's awesome, and it's a great song. So my current favorite band of all time is Skillet. It's been a wild ride listening to their music. Um, and I just got to go to one of their concerts, which was so awesome. Um, I love their music so much. They are just such an extraordinary band and their music is just so out of this world. It's, and it's crazy, <laughs> I love it. Um, it brings, as weird as it sounds, it brings peace to me, even if it's not necessarily the most peaceful music. Um, but it is something that I listen to constantly, um, especially their newest album. It's, in my mind, breathtaking. Um, and in other people's mind, it's more voice-taking because you yell at it. Um, yell the songs, uh, <laughs> especially during the concerts when everyone's screaming it, screaming the lyrics. Um, yes, I lost my voice a little bit. Um, it was such a cool experience, though. I got to see my first mosh pit. It was so cool. And um, that was really my first concert like that. Most of the concert I've been to have been sit down on a blanket on the lawn concerts. This was more <laughs> insane, um, but it's been really cool. It was a really cool experience to go see them. Um, and yeah, I'll always love Skillet. So my other music that I like is called Nightcore. Um, it's basically taking music that's already been produced by people and altering it so it sounds more like an anime song. Um, higher pitch, sometimes lower, and faster speeds most of the time. Um, and it's such a cool type of music that this genre. Um, I love it. I listen to all sorts of my favorite songs as nightcore versions. Um, I love the intensity of it, the the sense of excitement that it brings to me, of good times and of wanting to just have that fun, that energy, and that experience that it gives. Um, I just love it so much. It's such a great great genre of music that I really have gotten to love in the last little while.